All right, so we're all here. And uh, we'll go ahead and call the select board meeting for Wednesday, September 1st, 2021 to order. First order of business is the, oh yeah, I gotta do the usual reminders. Uh, this meeting's being recorded and attendance from the select board is David Phil, John Muskevitz, Joyce Chunglo, Jane Nevinsmith, and Amy Parsons. And all votes will be taken via roll call. Uh, let's see, consent agenda. We have warrants AP2208S, AP2208, AP2207, AP2207S, AP2206S, AP2206, AP2205, PR2204, AP2204, AP2204S, AP2205-2, AP2205S, PR2203, and use of the town commons, council on aging, violin concert, September 17th, and one day liquor license, top of the campus, football games, multiple dates. So moved. Second. Motion by Joyce, second by Jane. Anything on the consent agenda? All right, Jennifer. John is muted. Roll call vote. Roll call vote, Phil? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Chungalo? Yes. Wiskevitz? Yes. And Parsons? Yes. Okay, there you go. Uh, public comments. 3.1 on the agenda. We'll limit this to 15 minutes. Try to limit your comments to three minutes per person so that others may have the opportunity to speak. If anyone's here for a public comments, turn on your camera, wave at us, let us know you're here. All right, last call of public comments. <laughs> okay. We'll keep going. Did you see Mark's camera on? I don't. Mark, did you have something for public comments? I, I'm just waiting for the, the parking on the common. Okay, all right, we'll get to that. All right, so we'll jump. Is anybody here from planning board? Bill Dwyer's here, all right, so we've got Someone there, so we'll we'll jump down to Esalon Parking seven point one, and uh, actually, Bill, if you could give us kind of a, I guess, how did we get here? Why are we here? And what what the um, planning board would like to see happen to to fix the problem? That would be helpful. Be right with you. Okay, sure. I think I brought it to the select board at the last meeting for public comment um, because I had joined the uh, planning board meeting that night and I had made a couple of suggestions that I was to bring back to the select board. So there can be some resolution before they have their meeting next Tuesday uh, in regards to the park parking at Eslon. So we were going to be speaking about the West Street uh, parking situation. And um, I don't know if Bill wants to chime in on this now. That's that's why I brought it to the to the select board at our last meeting, and we were going to have further discussion on it tonight to make a resolution on it. So, uh, just for a full overview, when Esalon was originally approved, it had adequate parking for its floor area. This is uh, about 15 years ago, maybe I forget exactly when. Mark might remember. Well, Mark is, was not the owner at the time. He is a subsequent owner. But um, the problem is the Esalon has essentially doubled its dining area by expanding outdoors without adding anything to its parking. Now, I understand that Mark owns the business, but he does not own the site. He did, however, purchase the adjacent site, the Hadley uh, Garage, the Nabala Garage and uh, has been coming to us for several proposals for uses of that structure. And um, we did a waiver of uh, site plan approval for one use because 
Steve Lewis Subaru needed a quick location. And we did give warning that we were concerned about the parking situation on the common. And I think this has been something that various boards have been uh, very vocal about for several years here. Um, and most recently, we have this situation where he is developing a piece of land that is adjacent to the business that is creating the parking problem. And the planning board is asking him to use at least some portion of that property to solve the parking problem. Uh, so far, we haven't had a lot of, uh, there have been a lot of snags between COVID, between uh, dealing with Mass Highway and some concerns we've had about various aspects of the project. But, um, you know, here we are, and they're asking, uh, they're, the most recent development is that uh, Action Ambulance needed to find a new location, and this is being offered as a location for them. But we also have been dealing with the parking issue for quite a while. It has been a thorn in many people's sides, and um, we're just trying to figure out if they're, how we can make this work. Now, I hesitate to design projects. And I've often cautioned my board, other members of my board to not try to design a solution to something. But I did go out and gather some basic information that I hope would be helpful to you. I did uh, forward it to all of you. Um, John picked up that I had mislabeled my, uh, my PDF so I corrected that and resent it. But um, if uh, Jennifer, if you could let me share, uh, I will put up that uh, those slides. She looks like she's on the phone. Uh, you want to try it? See if you're allowed to. I'll, I'll try it. I'll see yeah. if I can. Uh, well, let's see. Apparently, I can. So um, these are images from Google Earth. They are dated. They are pre-pandemic, but they also were at a time when the uh, business was booming. So it does show you some of the impact of the parking. Since these images were taken, you have authorized no parking on the will be the west side of the street, the right hand side of the street as you are going south for about, it looks like about 300 feet. And you also have a no parking here to corner on the easterly side of the street, which is just about where this, from where this, just immediately to the left of where this picture was taken. So it's probably only about 30 feet down, uh, 30 feet in. So um, as you go down a little more, this is from the uh, first shot was at the, the front driveway from East Street. This shot is at the, the driveway into the back parking lot. And I walked down, it was not as nice a day as this, but I walked down to, um, sorry, wrong way. I walked uh, down to 109. There is a hydrant in front of 109 West Street. Uh, yeah, that should be 109 West. Um, and for further reference, that is just opposite uh, Divine Overhead Doors and pretty much the end of the business district as it goes 500 feet south on the common. Um, and then I look back and you can see that at that distance, about from the hydrant back to Route 9, you can see the damage to the common along the right-hand side. Now we're looking north. Um, and then I used the town GIS to measure the distances. So the, um, the fire hydrant in front of 109 <laughs> roughly 500 feet south of the intersection of Route 9 and West Street. Um, 
which as you see is only uh, two properties. Um, the Esalon property itself, uh, the tax parcel three, and then tax parcel two, which is 109. Um, it appears from the pictures that 500 feet is about as far as people are willing to walk. Then I decided to see what it would look like uh, the distance from the new overflow parking to the front door of Esalon is less than 175 feet. So um, what I am suggesting, and again, I only speak for 20% of the planning board, but what I would suggest if there was a sort of a carrot and stick approach here that um, People are not willing to park more than 500 feet away if they are properly educated that there is parking available only 175 feet away, um, coupled with enforcement of a no parking on either side for 500 feet down uh, on uh, that stretch of West Street, we may be able to solve the problem. And again, it's not inconveniencing a huge number of people. There are only two houses in that 500 foot stretch. Um, and I believe one, the owners of the, the house nearest to Esalon are very much in support of restricting uh, parking. So um, that's what I'm suggesting. I, the last time this was discussed, there were some, it was a little vague about exactly how far was far enough, but the common is sort of telling us that 500 feet seems to be it because beyond 500 feet, there is little noticeable damage. Um, the closer you get, the more damage there is. So if we could re help the common by making that 500 feet a no parking on either side zone, um, and if the owner would then uh, proceed to put up enough signage to make the overflow parking on the Hadley Garage site um, obvious, I think we may have a solution to the problem. Well, I have a question. That's to Mark. In looking at this map, Mark, it looks like from your back parking lot, that is the southern parking lot, would it be possible to go behind the garage building into the parking lot so people wouldn't have to go back out onto Route 9 to park? No. There is not access behind the Esalon property um, to go to the front. There is um, a state approved uh, through way through the front of the lot across uh, the front of Esalon and across the front of the garage that's been utilized for long before it was Esalon, uh, daily by the uh, Ned Bala garage, uh, by the Ned Balls and their customers, which everyone knows on the select board that that was one of the busiest places in town. Correct. Um, I'd just like to say that the last time I was on the planning board uh, meeting um, and speaking with Jim Maximoski, he also, Bill, on your um, pictures that you the 500 feet Jim used as the transformer, which I believe is right there at the 109 near the hydrant. Is that not correct where that transformer is on your other pictures? Uh, yes. Let me, let me see if I can get back to that. I think Jim used that as a marker uh, in what he was speaking about. So it all coincides with your hydrant and in that it's actually a little further. Uh, okay. If you will bear with me for a second. Um, that is the transformer. It okay. is a little north of the 500 foot line. And you can see that there is somewhere south of the transformer. Yep. So yep. call the transformer 425, 450, something like that. Uh, yep. It looks okay. like it needs to be a little bit further. Yep. Yeah, I agree. Then I'd, I'd be willing to make that motion to, um, I'm trying to think how we could uh, 
toe zone, I guess we could put. Uh, this would be a toe zone. Um, if anybody parked there, uh, was one of my thoughts. And I agree, I, I like to go back to that fire hydrant area. That looks about right, right, see the fire hydrant. Okay. I think that okay. gives us enough um, distance, as you say, that people aren't going to. When I think uh, Mark has, uh, from what I see with his sign, he's trying hard to get people to park over um, they are. And I think as a due diligence as a select board that we need to post signs and say no parking, period. Uh, this is a tow zone. Uh, I'm willing to go that route. I, I think, you know, it's, you know, I know that uh, he had parking for the amount of uh, his original. Um, and, and thank God he's expanded. He's done well. His place is very popular. Um, he's been a good community person that um, it contributes. And, you know, shame on the Board of Selectmen for not posting a little bit more on this common deal. But I would like to um, make that motion for the board, unless we, we can have more discussion. But I would like to post uh, a note from uh, where. Uh, has suggested um, to the end of to Route 9 um, so that people don't park on either side of the street. So we don't want them parking on in front of uh, residential areas and we don't want them parking on the uh, town common and see if we can get that cleaned up a little bit. So that would be my motion. So uh, my I question, oh, a second, I'm sorry. All right, second by Jane. Go ahead, Jane. My question my is if we post it, whether no parking or tow zone, who's going to enforce that? I don't see Mike Mason having a whole lot of extra people hanging out to just go give people tickets. Is that the kind of place we should subcontract with a tow company that they would just deal with all of it? I think that would be up to Mike Mason to do that. I think that if he feels that he can't, I mean, if they find that people are parking there, we have a right to ticket them and tow them. Uh, in any type of weather. They're not supposed to be parking on the streets anyway in, in uh, inclement weather. We have a standing um, ban on uh, snow and everything else right now. We have that in place. So that includes this street and any other street in town. But I think we, uh, you know, if, if the police find that they're parking there and doing their rounds, then they can have it towed. Um, or anybody else that sees it can call the police and say, hey, somebody's parked there. And I'm sure that they'll have time to come by and, and take care of that. But I think Mike Mason, chief, should be uh, in on this conversation. This isn't just us, but I, I know that he would be willing to, you know, have anybody enforce that. It's up to us to post it, and it's up to him to enforce it. So that's our he's, job. He's on tonight. Let's hear from him. Hang on, hang on. I got a lot to say about this. Way uh, back I'll, wait, around, I'll wait for John then. About a year and a half ago, we got on that bomb. And I did agree back when we made the decision to go to the first telephone pole back and post it uh, to get the emergency vehicles through fire trucks, police cruisers, uh, 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 uh you've got four other corners you got the old elmwood corner you've got the elite corner and you've got the tag sale corner and throughout the week periodically the common's pretty active on a good sunny day and everybody's parked on the common side which i don't have a problem with and they're having their lunch there or their breaks there the the town guys park their equipment there and have lunch there periodically on Fridays are there when they're mow. But uh, the residential side, I don't have a problem with posting. The common side, I do. The, the common side should be open uh, past the corners, telephone pole or two, um, on, the, on both sides on the entranceways, but not, not any further down. So I'm kind of looking at this, at least on the common side, as more of a temporary solution. Um, I agree with you, John, the, the common should be able to be used by people. I mean, Consulent Aging does their stuff out there. Um, some of the farm workers park their cars out there. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of hoping that 
you know, maybe once the overflow parking lot is opened over at Eslon and just, you know, the, the same repeat customers know where they're supposed to be going, uh, they can kind of be trained that, hey, that's the overflow parking rather than the common. And maybe we can take down yeah. some of the signs from the, from the common. Mark has put up signs at the end of, the, of his driveway that says overflow parking this way with arrows and everything. So he, he's making a great attempt to get them off the common for sure. It's someone's yeah. homes are still so used to parking on the common that that's where they go. Chief, do you want to talk about enforcement real quick? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I actually agree with everything that's been said, a little bits and pieces of what each uh, board member has said. Uh, I would be hesitant, and I, actually, I won't, I won't even say hesitant. I will say right off the bat, we won't use the bylaw. Um, on this, um, you know, I, I explained to the residents when the bylaw was passed that this is for, you know, it was for snow removal and town operations. So we're not going to be citing people based on the bylaw. You know, um, that was what it was really intended for, even though it is all year, even though it is for any purpose. Um, we would rely on no parking for that situation. I would agree with what the chair just said in that I would hope that with some enforcement and some education, the town, uh, the common side signs would, able, would be able to be removed. Um, that would be my hope. Um, also what Jane said, you know, I certainly, I, I don't know that I can put somebody out there all the time, every day. You know, we can certainly uh, ramp up enforcement in the beginning and try to educate folks. And we will certainly help um, with that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we can certainly, we can certainly do it. Uh, and, and it's, it's really the board's discretion as to how long you want the signs to stay on the common side, uh, or if they're needed at all, but you are going to need more signs than are there now. Um, and they're obviously from what, uh, Mr. Dwyer mentioned, they're going to have to stretch back further, but we, we have a couple of officers who I actually spoke with today, knowing that this was on the agenda who do fairly regularly go out there. Um, and ticket cars. One of them was actually uh, towed recently because as the officer was ticketing it, he found that the card was unregistered as well. Uh, so they do go out there and do it. We can certainly step it up. Um, but, you know, as Jane mentioned, we do have a lot of other places in town that don't allow parking that they have to keep an eye on as well. So certainly willing to help any way we can. Joyce, can I make a friendly amendment to your motion that we post it as uh, subject to ticketing or towing? So that way we can, uh, we can hire Ernie's or somebody to come, you know, do their patrols and tow people or the officers can ticket people either way. You're muted. You're muted, Joyce. There you go. I certainly don't want to know how healthy the police are, but when in their rounds, not telling them to concentrate on just, uh, uh, West Street because that's really not fair because of other, we have a whole town to take into consideration. As they're doing their rounds, we have officers on duty every day, and I know that things are ramping up because of college kids coming back. It's a lot busier than uh, what it has been. So if they can around if they find it, they're doing the ticket and, uh, and we i suggest also ernie's is doing that too and they see it and they're tall that, that process would have to work a little bit differently than it worked down at the reservoir but we can certainly do both so if the sign says both that would work the best and i got ticket most of what joyce said but I, i'm pretty sure i'm in agreement with it <laughs> You, you broke up quite, your audio is kind of bad tonight for some reason, at least for me. So I just wanted to make sure you're okay with that amendment to your motion. Uh, I, your... I certainly am. Okay, cool. Okay, and, cool. Uh, Bill, you had something? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to, uh, uh, along the lines of temporary solutions, some of you may remember that we had exactly the same problem with uh, Alina's, or more specifically, uh, whatever preceded Alina's. Carmelina's. Carmelina's, uh, where they were parking on the other branch of West Street. Yes. And they had people parking in the Esalon parking lot when it was Hapco Auto Parts and <laughs> running across Route 9 in the dark to get 
uh, from parking to Carmelinas. Yeah. Uh, when they acquired rights to the uh, property next door, that problem resolved itself. And hopefully this problem will resolve itself. You don't see uh, uh, Alina customers parking on the common or on that part of West Street at all. So uh, I'm hopeful that this can be, th this is part of a, a two-pronged approach, provide convenient parking and deter parking where we don't want it. So does that, oh, does that sound all right for the planning board to have us post those signs of ticket or tow? Um, at uh, park at your own risk, um, something along those lines, you will be ticketed or towed. Have that up for, um, I don't know, what's, is there a time limit or shall we see how it goes? And if we don't need them after a certain period of time, we can take them down. Does that, is, is, does that sound like something the planning board would agree to? Uh, again, I speak for only 20% of the planning board and I did notify everyone that there would be an opportunity to be heard tonight, but uh, I think that that addresses uh, substantially our concerns that uh, we understand that it is difficult for Mark to control all of his off-premises parking, uh, but uh, if we can work together on this and break some habits, uh, mm -hmm. I know people still turn left onto cross path, but not so much as they used to. Yeah. So if we can break some habits and give the, uh, you know, part of it is that whatever business, the parking is, the routine parking is causing damage to the common. It clearly mm -hmm. is more damage there. We know why it's more damage there. Uh, so that's part of what we want to do. Tackle, tackle that and, uh, you know, support the business. But if we have to support it by making it less comfortable for the customers, I'm sorry that has to be the way it, it goes. But, um, you know, we're balancing equities here. So I, I don't think park at your own risk necessarily, but uh, subject to ticket and tow would um, do the job. Yep. And some enforcement, some real enforcement over. <clears throat> yeah, I want to. I want to mention that the this will be extremely helpful. We've we've painted the lines over in the lot. We've we put arrows over there and put up several signs. We've had a a major reduction in the amount of cars that are parking on the common, um, and I've been actively going out and speaking to people that have parked on the common and there's varying number of responses. Um, some are happy to move their cars over to the overflow parking. The ones that have had difficulties with the desire to move the cars are Hadley residents who say, parking's allowed on the common, I'm parking on the common. And what am I supposed to say to them? They're Hadley residents. They're allowed to do whatever is allowed in Hadley. And as far as I know, parking is allowed in the common. So this will help alleviate some of those issues. And we are once, uh, at, at least I hope that this is enough for the planning board to approve the building, um, which will redo the parking lot, take down our outbuilding, um, bring in action ambulance almost within weeks um, because they they need a new home uh, immediately. Um, and we want to put this all together. And um, once the signs are up, everything should flow nice and smoothly. Um, we have a great plan set up and we look forward to putting this all together. Yeah, and we, we look forward to assisting you too, Mark. We appreciate your business in town. It certainly has grown in reputation and shame on those Hadley residents for parking on the common because they're, they haven't been listening to what we've been going on here. So hopefully they will abide by the rules because they're going to have to one way or another. So um, uh, again, yeah. let's go forward and make things work for you. 
Hey, right. Joey. With the proper signage in, uh, there isn't going to be people parking. There hasn't been people parking in the house side, except for a few stragglers who uh, Chief yep. Mason mentioned. And if the signs are properly laid out as they would be in a city, you're not going to have any problems over there. Yep, I agree. Joey's okay, that, that's my motion then. Uh, just just for clarity, I'm gonna I'm gonna Jennifer's laughing at me. All right, so we're gonna the motion is 500 feet no parking on either side of the southwest part of West Street, and post it as subject to ticketing or towing, and uh, that's for both sides. <clears throat> and yes, that's the motion correct. I thought yes. that it was only gonna be on the residential side. No, both sides. We don't want them parking on the common Jane side. We want them 500 feet back to the fire hydrant for the time being until people get used to uh, not parking there anymore. And then we will revisit this uh, situation, I would say, in a six month time frame. Does that sound good? Revisit? Yep. In the dead of winter when no one's going to be parking there anyway? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I don't know people. They'll see the street plowed, Amy. Are you kidding? <laughs> I need a second. Oh, at least, at least no, when I, there's snow, you can use the bylaw for right. the snow. You can do it that way if you want. <laughs> can, I, can I just get a second no, I, of that motion, please? Now sorry. that we're clear on what it is. I'll second that. All right. So motion by now. Joy, second by Amy. Anything else? I think, uh, Chief, did I see your hand back up again? Did you have something else? I, I just I was actually asking what you were asking, David. I just wanted some clarity because it sounds like there's some confusion as to whether or not we want to allow people parking on the common because we've always allowed people to park on the common. So if the idea of this is to stop that practice, the signs absolutely now that five hundred feet on that business side. So there's still parking on a common except we're post. Correct. Okay. Now, the only thing, too, is I know, like, in the past, pre-crazy time, um, there was the... festival ...where people were on the comic, another thing to consider, but... It's not like it's every day, Amy. So no, I mean, it's like a special situation, but... Correct. It's special events and, and things of that nature. Those are totally different. I was actually I was actually talking to, to Mitch about that today when we were talking about these signs. And I'm sure Chris Okafor uh, could very easily they can cut they they can cover them. Any of those signs can be easily covered. They do it everywhere in cities and towns. You can just cover the signs on days that you want to have an event or whatever it is. No big deal. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. Let's vote on this. Thank you. Oh, that's good. Put a, put a last, over call. It. last call for comments. Jennifer, roll call. Jennifer? Jennifer. Uh, her microphone's messed up. Carolyn, would you mind doing it? Hold up little placards, like roll call vote. Yeah. <laughs> Bill? Yes. Chunglo? Yes. Muscovitz? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Parson? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, Mark, thanks for showing up, and Bill, too. Thank you for coming, and hopefully, uh, good luck, Mark, on th next Thursday. Mm. Tuesday. Oh, Tuesday. Okay. All right. <laughs> Good Lord, <laughs> Rochester. Uh, all right. So moving on from parking, I, I see we have finance committee here, and I think uh, Dan is here. So let's jump down to uh, five point one single versus split tax rate presentation, since I think that that's what finance is here for. Um. Are we posted for a finance as well? Yes. They can always yeah. join. Yeah. Yes, they are. All right. There's Amy. I see Amy there. So, um, and Dan. See, he's here somewhere. 
Tanner, are you ready to go? Yep, I'm all set. Okay. Okay, uh, we're making this presentation now, so you have some information before we actually have the classification hearing in November. Uh, a couple things that I want to start out with. Uh, the information in this report is estimated. We'll have final numbers at the classification hearing at the first meeting in November, but those numbers will change slightly from what you're going to see here. Another thing is that splitting the tax rate will not increase revenue for the town of Hadley. So we're going to take in the same amount of money, whether we have a split rate or a single rate. The Board of Assessors has not made a recommendation at this time for fiscal 22. They're waiting until we get the final numbers in and they will be making a recommendation at the fiscal 22 classification hearing. And like I said before, this is to give you some preliminary information so you can think about what you might wanna do in advance of the hearing. Uh, splitting the tax rate will keep the residential and commercial percentage is about the same as they were in fiscal 21. If the rate is split, it could be changed in a future year when commercial values rebound to keep tax payments stable. This chart shows the residential and open space percentage versus the commercial, industrial, and personal property percentage for the last dozen or so years. The two highlighted numbers at the top are the most relevant. You can see the, the numbers below that, it's been pretty much 65% residential, 35% commercial, industrial, and personal. Last year, it went up to 66 and a half for residential, 33 and a half for commercial. We're estimating that it's gonna be 69.3 and 30.6 for the current fiscal year. This is a, a pie chart showing last year's percentage. The commercial is blue, the residential is yellow. And you can see the 352 was 352 million was this year's last year's commercial value, and 698 was the residential. Next year we're estimating a 322 commercial and a 730 residential. The commercial section, a lot of the larger box stores or larger commercial section got hit pretty hard last year on their income, the rental income and expense section, and the values are gonna be dropping probably about 10% as estimated as shown on this chart. Uh, they'll be going, yeah, it'll be going down roughly 10% for 22. That 10% that would have been paid by commercial is gonna be shifted over to the residential class. The following charts are gonna show what residential and commercial, what we're estimating they're paying for last, or what they actually paid for 21 and what they're gonna pay for 22 with a single rate or a split rate. This chart gives the fiscal 21 residential taxes. The rate was $12. The first five parcels are the ones we use in the classification report every year. I've added another random residential parcel and the F slash R1, that is three parcels that constitute a farm a residential parcel with two chapter land parcels owned by the same owner. And that is their fiscal 21 value was 3057 and they paid 3667 in taxes. The average was 350, 200, and the average bill was 4202. For commercial, these the first five are the same five that are used in the classification report. I added three more larger commercial parcels on the bottom. C1, C2, and C3, and you can see what they're paying in taxes. These eight parcels paid 531,000 in taxes. If we go with a single rate, this is the same slide, the residential slide, but I've added in a, three more columns. The, the fourth column in is their new value for fiscal 22. If we have a single rate, it would be 1250. So the, the FY22 taxes single rate is that fifth column. And the sixth column shows how much their taxes would go up. So 
it's 265, 291, 337, 213, 236. The other parcel was 299, and the farm parcels with the house is 309. The bottom, I've got the average, it would go from 4202 to 4596, or an increase of $394 a year. This is the same slide with the commercial values. And you can see some of the commercial values stayed the same, some dropped. The big ones are the, the ones on the bottom, C1, C2, and C3. Those dropped significantly. So if you look at the, the increase, the first five parcels, two of them are going down, three of them are going up slightly with a single rate, but the three on the bottom are the big ones. C1 is gonna go down 10,500, C2 is gonna go down 44,179, and C3 is gonna go down almost 10,100 for a $64,000 decrease. That's just for these few parcels here. Uh, residential, I added a, a two columns on the end. If you split the rate and do a 10% shift, it should be 1185 for residential. So it's got the new taxes put in there and the end is what they would pay with a split tax rate. So the five parcels we normally use, you're gonna see almost no change in three of the parcels, a slight increase in one and about the average increase in the, in the fifth parcel. The other parcel is going up slightly below average and the farm parcel is gonna go up just about average. The average house would go up $155 instead of 394. This slide has the split rate for commercial with the 10% increase, the tax rate would go to $14. Now, you can see here, it, it's kind of tricky in that the first five parcels, three of the parcels are actually going to go up $1,000, $1,600, and almost $2,100. Two parcels would go up $295 and $461. But the, the real problem emerges when you still look at the bottom three. The major commercial parcels are still, even with a split rate, are going to drop $6,185. And, and the, the last one wasn't impacted as much by COVID they're gonna go up about 8,000. So overall, instead of going down 64,000 on the last slide, they're gonna go down about 11,000 in value. And as you can see from the previous slides, if we go with a single rate or a split rate, some taxpayers will pay more, some will pay less, and some will pay about the same. Splitting the rate on a temporary basis for 22 will make most of the tax payments stable. The split rate percentage could be reevaluated in 23 and potentially adjusted back to a single rate when commercial values rebound post COVID. Sales in 2020, calendar 2021, have indicated that both commercial and residential values are going up significantly. We've had a lot of, well, not a lot, but a few commercial sales that have taken place that have gone for a lot more than the assessed value. Uh, a summary, splitting the rate will not bring in additional revenue. Splitting the rate would keep residential and commercial percentages about the same as they were in 21. And if the rate was split, it could be changed in a future year when commercial values rebound to keep tax payments stable. One last thing, last year our tax rate went from $12.78 to $12. So every commercial property in town saw roughly a 6.2% reduction in their tax bill and their actual taxes paid. So that, that, while that isn't a lot, if you go back to these numbers here, uh, this parcel, the parcel A, where it's roughly $6,000 tax bill, they would have been about 6,300 the year before, which would actually, if you look at that, this is a $700 increase over two years. And then these parcels numbers could would go down if you look at a two-year average on it. Are there any questions? Uh, Dan, how many towns in the area split their rates currently? And if, if you don't have the data, just you know, what percentage do you think? There's nobody in Hampshire County. Most of the communities that do it have been doing it long-term. 
they're mostly cities that have a large commercial base. One of the presentations that I attended from the DOR, there's three communities in Hampshire County that have a 15% or greater commercial base. And Northampton and Ware are two, Hadley is the third, and we're at 35 and the other two are at 15 and 18. So we're really, we're really taking a bigger hit than most other communities around here or having a bigger impact on our residential taxes because the commercial base in Hadley is so large. Does splitting a tax rate affect uh, the outcome of abatement requests for commercial properties at all? Are they? Uh, um, I think if we split the rate, we would have more commercial abatements. I think we're going to have a large number of commercial abatements irregardless if we split the rate. Lowering the values will help the outcome of any cases that go to the ATB, it's going to be hard for somebody to come in and say, yeah, I, my property's not worth this. And we actually lowered the value 15 or 20% for one year. And they're producing appraisals. They're going to have a hard time producing an appraisal saying it's worth significantly less than that. Okay. Dan, I have a question. Yeah. Dan, I remember we have gone over this question over the years from time to time. And I remember, I thought I remember you telling us one time that whenever this kind of thing is proposed, the other, uh, you know, the businesses risk um, suing us, you know, that there would be a lot of pushback if we tried to enact that kind of a, a change to the tax structure, is that no longer a, a, an issue? That, that would be an issue if this was a permanent option that we were yeah. looking at. And I'm not saying it, it's temporary or permanent, that's up to the Board of Selectmen. But I think what's gonna happen is when commercial taxpayers get their bill, they're gonna look at what they paid last year versus what they're paying this year. and it's actually going to be, if we go with a single rate, it's going to be significantly lower. So a lot of businesses aren't going to see a large increase in their tax bill. Oh, I see. And if you do it on one year, so if we, if we drop values by 10% for fiscal 22 overall for commercial, and then they go back up that 10% for 23, we can just go back to a single rate. Yes. And keep the same percentage. So it's I more see. of just a temporary it's basically filling in a pothole before you can repair the whole street. Yeah. So it just smooths it out. So it's level from 21, 22 and 23. Got it. Thank you. I think there'll be a few communities across the state. They're going to have to adopt a split rate for this year that normally do not. Any other questions for Dan? Any other finance select board people want to chime in? Uh, I have a question. Uh, would the impact on small businesses be greater or lesser in this? I mean, I know they're smaller, so it's going to be abs on an absolute scale less. But are we going to be really damaging anyone by doing this? One of the arguments in the past against not doing it is, and I'll, I'll, I'll use farmers, for example. Uh, if you've got a lot that's not in chapter, you're going to get about a 10% bump in your taxes. If, you've got, if your parcel is in chapter and you live in town, you're going to see more savings on your home than you'll see an increase on your chapter parcels because of this. And I think that a lot of the small businesses, if they live in town, the, the property owners, they're going to see a reduction in their home to offset what they're paying in their business. The, the big problem we're having are the really big businesses in town. The, the $3 million, $4 million, $5 million, $20 million properties are going down, and that, that's a lion's share of the commercial property. So if you go... If I go back to, oh, where's commercial? Yeah. If you look here, there's three major commercial properties. And even with the split rate, 
those three properties, one's going up eight, one's going down 18, and another one's going down six. So we're still seeing a $16,000 shift. The smaller businesses might get, get tapped a little bit more, but if, they're, if they live in town, they'll see a reduction on their, their homes. I mean, obviously, if you take parcel D here, where it's going up $2,089, they're not going to see a $2,000 reduction on their home, but they might see a 250 or 300 reduction, which kind of offsets three of the five that we normally use. It's really tricky because not all the values, if everything was dropping 10%, it would be really easy to do, but it, that's not really what's happening. And in conjunction with residential values going up about 6%. Dan, one of the, uh, the comments that I typically get from people around town is, you know, they want to see the Walmarts and the targets of the world pay a little bit more because they can afford it, but they want to spare the, the, either the smaller businesses or the, the farmers, like you said, that aren't in chapter from having an increase. Is there a way to split out agricultural property from commercial so that way they're not affected or does it have to be just commercial and residential? We can include uh, only chapter land parcels and move it from right now, chapter land parcels are considered commercial. That could get shifted over to, re to open space if we chose to do that. The problem is, is that it's going to make a nominal increase of the farm residential parcel here where they're paying $3,667. $3,664 is the house. $3 is the agricultural value for the, the 20 acres of farmland. So it's a 10% bump. The guy's going to pay 30 cents more a year. But is there a way to move non-chapter land under residential so that way that's not subject to the higher commercial rate? Or uh Not really. If it's farmed, it, it has to be coded as a 3930, which is commercial. Okay. Agricultural, not farmed. One of the options we could look at is doing the small commercial exemption. I know there's not a lot of parcels that qualify for that, but we could, we could grant a, a reduction for some small commercial. As long as it's assessed for less than a million, it has less than 10 annualized employees on the on the property, they could get a reduction in their taxes. So with that, let's just say I have 50 acres of farmland that's not in chapter, that's classified as commercial because it has to be. Um, could somebody on that tent, you know, the, on that 50 acres apply for an exemption as a small commercial parcel? Uh, I don't think we have many parcels that are 50 acres. Okay. Well, and, and and our, yeah, yeah it, under a million dollars. Basically. There's very few parcels over five acres that are not in chapter that are being actively farmed. Okay. The ones so, that we're really looking at are parcels that are two or three acres that have the ones that would get hit are the ones that have development potential where you could break it out and get a building lot or two building lots out of that parcel where they may see an increase of 150 or $160 a year. But that's an option, though, if, if we went to the small commercial exemption, that two and three acre. Uh, uh, no, it actually has to be on the list from Department of Employment as being a certified business with 10 or fewer employees. So if there's a farm, they could, but most of the smaller parcels are actually just being rented by the larger farmers in town. Okay. Anybody, uh, any more questions? Well, we've been discussing this for over nine years. And in the past, I followed it through. And everybody, just for some of the reasons you stated, David, nobody wants to take the chance. And then if we go back, you know, you, you're just looking for trouble by splitting it. I, I just can't see it working. 
out to benefit the town, you know, and, and I know the valuations are going up on the residential, but on the news I'm watching and they say the housing boom is, is about to crash. So I don't know if it's going to crash in Hadley or not, but it's something to take into consideration when we do vote one way or the other on it. I, I, I'm not for splitting it, so. And Dan, when's the classification hearing typically held? Uh, I believe this year's hearing is scheduled for the first selectman's meeting in first or second meeting in November. Okay, so we got a little. Bit I think. To think about I it. think the hearing is the first meeting, and the if you want to delay, we can hold it off till the second for the vote. So there's still almost three months before we have to. And we should have. I'm hoping we have the final numbers by the end of this month. So does anybody, select board or finance committee, is there any data or charts or anything that Dan could come up with that would help you make your decision one way or another? Not, not for me. I, uh, I, I guess I'm exactly, uh, my thoughts are exactly what John just said. I mean, our great, we have great intentions and, and we say we're going to, like sometimes we take from stabilization, we're going to put it back and we just don't. So I'm afraid that if we go ahead and we split and we say, okay, we'll fix it later, something, an emergency, something else always comes up. So I, in my personal opinion um, is the same as John's. And um, so it doesn't, you know, we, we look at this every year and there's reason after reason um, why we don't want to split tax rates sometimes. So um, even if it's, even if there's great charts here, I, I'm still, it's going to be hard to sway my my thoughts. Could, every, you, know, every could you year, build a sun? Sorry. You know, every year, like I said, since I've been on the board, they said it, it's it could go back. So if we do have a problem with splitting and it does go back, I mean, how is that going to affect the business decision uh, to stay or to go? You know whether they're big box or small family businesses. It, it's, it's a hell of a thing to put the customer through at this point, the taxpayer through at this point. Could you build a sunset provision into this motion so that it would automatically go back next year unless we actively chose to do it again? The selectmen have to actively vote this every year. So if they voted a split rate for fiscal 22, they still have to go through in fiscal 23 and we hold the hearing again and they would vote. The, the problem that most communities have is that communities that vote a split rate, you're not seeing the massive valuation shift that, we, that we're gonna see from 21 to 22 in commercial values. Typically the residential values go up, the commercial values go up a little bit and it's fairly constant. If you look at that chart that I had, we've been between 64 and 66% residential, probably since I bet, since I started here 30 years ago. Right now we're gonna be at almost 70% residential. That's a big shift for one year, a big swing. So I, I anticipate commercial values coming back next year for 23. I mean, we've had two sales in town, two commercial sales, that have sold for significantly more than what I figured they would during COVID. So we're looking at values probably going up significantly and depending on if COVID, if we have another surge or a, a, another wave, I think based on what we're taking in meals, we're on par for our highest meals tax since that's been instituted and motel is, seems to be coming back but we'll know more. We should be getting a, a first quarter payment this month by the end of this month. So we'll know from hotel if it's up. It, it'll definitely be up from last year at this time. And the meals is gonna be really up. All the additional outdoor seating plus the price increases on the, what they're charging is really bringing in a lot of money on meals. Dan, I have a question for you. Um, 
in researching this so you could report on it, um, do, do you find yourself feeling that this is the thing that we should do? In the past, and this is just me speaking, and my board has in the past has recommended that we keep a single rate, that we not go with a split rate. Because like I've, we've said in the past, once you adopt it, it's tough to go back. I think this situation is going to be completely different from all the other years because the values are going to shift and we're probably going to drop from 69 to 66 or 67 percent for 23 because the values will come back. So you can tweak that number and reduce it down or even go back to a single rate. Just that you're now looking at the average residential is going to go up about $400 for this fiscal year. That's if we don't do the split rate. If there's no split, it'll go up about 100 and, uh, 395. If you split it, it'll probably be about 150, 145. So if we split it this year and then go back next year, what do you think that's going to be for the basic resident in town? Uh, if you split it this year, it, it's going to be for the average residents, it's going to be about $155. If you then, put it back next year, I would assume it would be, depending on how spending goes, the typical increase for us has been about $150 a year, $140. If you go with a single rate, what would happen is if the percentages fall back in line for fiscal 23, the average residential property would probably go down about $200 a year, $150 to $200 while the average commercial would go up a sizable amount, probably 10%, 12% next year. So either way, we're either commercials going up this year or while not going up, they're, they're, they're actually going down less if you split it. But if you leave it as a single next year, it would take a big jump, the percentage that they pay. Thank you. I think we've I think we've always um, struggled with this over the years, and you know I've been doing this for eighteen years. Um, every year we vote on this, and you know we have now are just coming out of COVID. Businesses have started to do better. The house prices in town, people are getting way above any asking price. There's been price wars on all of the homes that have been sold. Um, people are, are paying ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 more um, than what they would have. Um, and it just amazes me on actually what the houses are going for um, that you wouldn't think would be selling for the price that they are. Um, but people, the, the houses aren't even on the market uh, a week or more before they're snatched up. I mean, it's just unbelievable. And I don't think we're doing any fair thing for the business to do a split rate at this point. Uh, I'm not exactly in favor of this right now. I, you know, I have until November to think about it and, and revisit it. Um, but I think keeping it as it is, um, these people have bought their homes. They know what they're getting into. They know what the, the tax rate is when they move into Hadley. Um, we are trying to help the businesses stay in town. And if you're trying to increase their taxes just to offset people's home taxes, that, that's not really fair. We have always, always from, even when I was on school committee, we have declared Route 9 as our business district. They are the district that have kept our taxes at this low rate that we all appreciate at this moment. Um, and I just think that, you know, from now until November, let's all really think about this and see if we want to, um, give a shove to the businesses or do we all just want to take it as it comes and do what we need to do um, to keep our town at the tax rate that we have. Um, so everybody just think about it and, and we'll talk about it again in November, but that's my, my point right now. Okay. Um, anything else on this before we move on? 
All right. Well, thank, thanks, Dan. I appreciate the presentation. Okay. Thanks. All right. And uh, Finance Committee, do you have anything else tonight or just that was it? That, that was it. We just wanted to hear what Dan had to say. All right. Well, then uh, we'll, I, I guess, conclude the joint portion of the meeting so you guys can, can escape out of here if you so like. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, all right, we'll, we'll move to uh, Carolyn. Do you want to do uh, 6.1 special town meeting warrant draft? Sure. Can you bring that up, Jennifer? So this is a draft, a true draft. It's the first one that we're presenting to you. It is um, several of them are basically placeholders that you have typically seen uh, at each special town meeting. Uh, as soon as that goes up, I'll just start. And it, it'll be fairly quick because we don't have numbers in place. Uh, capital has not met and finance has not met. So I'll just wait. Okay, here it is. Sorry, I've had technical difficulties with my computer this evening. Yeah. Thanks, Jennifer. Okay, so uh, Article 1 is your, the usual, what you usually have, your first article, which is the omnibus budget. Uh, there, there are going to be some changes, uh, but we don't have the details yet uh, because we are still working on some of the issues that I'll be talking about at the next meeting that we'll be working out with staffing issues. Uh, so we're, we, we're, this is still preliminary. We don't have the numbers and really a significant presentation on what those staff changes might be or, or recommended. Um, article two is sewer water and Hadley Media Enterprise funds. There won't be we don't think there's gonna be budget changes, but there may be funding changes as to where that, those, re those uh, revenues will come from to pay for that, uh, such as ARPA and other resources. So article three is prior year bills to see if the town will vote to transfer money into water reserves and um, an amount from sewer reverse reserves and raise an appropriate, a certain amount to pay for FY 2021 invoices. So again, it's preliminary. We still don't have all the information if we do have any prior bills. So uh, we'll be updating that as well in a few weeks. Article four is uh, the sweep articles, clean up prior capital balances. Um, we, we will be giving, getting some back. We will be, sorry, we will have, we will have some money coming back, um, but we don't have those numbers yet. And then capital articles, capital has not met these are simply requested articles. So we have actually gone through this and there are some of these articles that we'll be talking with capital about um, that we will see if the departments can wait until the annual town meeting. This is simply information, just providing you that information that's been requested. I just wanna make sure you know that this has not gone into any discussion with capital or, or finance committee. Did you want me to go? You can just see the list right there, all right. Article uh, five is um, prior, ca uh, prior capital articles. Uh, to we know that one of those article articles, if that is um, recommended by capital, there is some, which is the gas pumps, we will be asking to use a prior, to take money from a prior article and redirect it to, re to the replacement of the gas pumps. So we just put that placeholder in, in case that is a favorable recommendation. Article six is transfer of the Goodwin Memorial. Uh, as you know, uh, the deed still states that the trustees owns Goodwin Memorial. So we would need to have a vote at town meeting to transfer, transfer ownership from the trustees back to the town. Article seven is special revenue account for ambulance services. This is again, it's just under discussion right now and uh, it may or may not stay here. It's, I just got it there as a placeholder. 
and articles eight through 12, eight through 12 are the CPA articles that are typically on there. Articles 13 and 14 are placeholders. Those are reserved for planning board that we don't have yet if there, if there is going to be any. Um, and article 15 is you did um, vote in the spring to put this on the special town meeting warrant for the mosquito opt out. Uh, there has been an update from Senator Comerford that she did have some uh, disappointing news for other communities that they weren't able to um, get that from the state that they would be able to opt out. So there's still more discussion about that that I'll, I'll keep you updated with to see whether it will be relevant to put on here or not. But right now I've got that here as a um, placeholder. And that's it. All right. Anybody have any questions on that before we move on? All right, we'll keep going. Uh, let's see, we'll get on to 7.2 Hatfield 350th invite. Um, Cher from the 350th uh, Hatfield committee has invited the uh, select board, the historical committee, and also the chiefs, I believe it is. Uh, let me pull up the date here so I don't give the wrong one. Um, all right, it is October 3rd at 3 p.m. There's a, um, a, a dinner and a celebration for volunteers and everybody that's participated. And so it is, uh, uh, I guess Mike Mason's not invited, just uh, Chief Spank Nable and uh, uh, Deputy Chief Bryant. So. And, uh, <laughs> Historical Commission and the Select Board. So she wanted me to extend that invite and she's also going to uh, send over an email. So just put it on your calendar. Um, 7.3 DPW trailer update. Carolyn, do you wanna talk about that? Yeah, I will. So I have brought this, I think I brought this up at the previous meeting that uh, I, I think due to the weather and the age of the aging, uh, get, getting very um, old, trailers that the DPW has been in. Uh, as a reminder, they've been in it for over 20 years, those trailers, and they were meant to be temporary. Um, and so they've, they've really gone, they've really extended their life. And this very damp summer, uh, I, I do have concerns about the environment for the uh, employees that are working in those trailers. So I would like to get um, a formal um, approval from the select board uh, to move forward with replacing those trailers. Uh, we can use ARPA funds, but again, that would, uh, once we uh, have a recommendation for you as far as how you want to fund that, uh, I, I would like to move forward with that. I do have the building committee at Gary, as well as um, Tim is doing some of the homework to find out some costs. I think that we can replace those for less than 60000 but again, they would be temporary because as a reminder, I do, I am working with an uh, engineer to draw up a proposal, a scope of work to do a, feasibil a feasibility study for a permanent solution for DPW, but that's gonna be a few years out. And I would, I, I just strongly recommend that those trailers get replaced temporarily to get us through that time period and, and as soon as possible. Yeah, I'd like to see them replaced, but I don't think we're ready to put a new facility there yet at this point with all our other projects and expenses. As, yeah. This is just a study that you had, you had left, uh, money left over um, that was designated for that, to look at that as a feasibility study. So that's, I just wanted to get an idea of what we were looking at and it would be looking at all different options as well. And they know that this is uh, going to be a few years out, but I did want to just get that process rolling. You know, after watching the news and seeing all the issues everyone else had from closed buildings to minimal operation buildings, uh, the amount of mold that's going on with everybody else, I, I, a good thorough cleaning of those trailers would probably help without replacing them right now. You know, uh, the basic sweeping and vacuuming is one thing, but through throughout COVID, you know, we're going through the same thing with these air purifiers. We can't maintain the filters in them. We don't have them. I got your email, Jennifer. I see we're on, on the works with it. But we've got the stuff that we're not maintaining first. If we can't maintain what we have, what are we going to do with the new trailers? We did the same thing with the old buildings. We really got to concentrate on maintenance here. Some I agree that 
I agree we need to look at maintenance, especially for our new buildings, but the trailers do not qualify as new buildings. They are decrepit. They have seen a better life. They were not given an age of more than 25 years, and we've kept them in service for way longer than they were scoped for, and we've gotten our money's worth from them. <coughs> I'll, I'll make a motion for Carolyn to pursue uh, trailers for the DPW and a feasibility study for anything further down the road for the a building or whatever might be needed down there, but we know that it's not right now, but it will be in the future. So those things need to absolutely get done. I second. Okay, motion by Joyce, second by Jane. Anything else on that? Jennifer? Roll call vote, Phil? Yes. No. Nevin Smith? Yes. Chungalo? Yes. <clears throat> Muscovitz? Uh, abstain. And Parsons? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, Carolyn, another one for you. You're busy tonight. Uh, 7.4 Conservation Commission update. Sure. We're continuing to do our due diligence to, uh, to support the Conservation Commission and look at different possibilities of filling in for that, of uh, the gap of not having an agent. Um, I did, I've had different people that have reached out. One these are just examples of what we're looking at. Um, but we've we even had a recent grad um, who, that her major was environmental and conservation. Uh, she would like to see how she can help. Uh, she's got, uh, she's involved with other things, but she may be able to help out um, at a somewhat minimal assistance, but also we, it could be providing a place for her to learn and get that on her resume. Um, but we would still need some more support than that. So I still, I'm still in contact with the conservation agent um, who has been looking at some of the history of conservation here, looking at the wetlands protection bylaw, um, and we're waiting to hear more from her. Uh, so I am confident, to, you know, despite that gap right now, that MassDOT is moving forward, that widening project. Uh, and, and the latest information I have is that construction would be starting uh, late winter, early spring. So. Uh, I, I have not heard that it is not moving forward. So that was the, the latest information I had was that things are still moving forward with Route 9. Okay. Um, bylaw committee. Sure. I think that's one of the most common thing I've heard as I've worked here, which believe it or not is going to be a year and a couple weeks, um, is that some issues that have come up uh, it has been, well, we don't have a bylaw for that or that bylaw is outdated. So I, I wanted to ask the select board to consider forming a bylaw review committee. Um, it can be very beneficial to the town to do that. It's a long process. It, it takes about a year and a half to do it right. And uh, it, it's a good opportunity to discover what bylaws may be absent, what, which bylaws are outdated. Uh, update those that may no, no longer comply with mass general law or, or even some that may be obsolete, which I suspect there, there may be some of those. Uh, the new committee, um, there's even new committees that may not be on that in the bylaws. So I, I, I would like to see if uh, that can be looked at as well. I, I, it may mean that nothing needs changing, but I think it's a really good opportunity. And because it comes up uh, more frequently uh, that it, there's issues that are, are that reflect on some needs to look at that bylaw. Um, that would be just my recommendation um, that the select board would consider appointing uh, a committee for that. And typically community, communities will use uh, a representative from departments that are impacted by the bylaws and have to make decisions based on the bylaws as well as um, interested residents. So I, I, that would be my recommendation if you guys would agree to that. Yeah, I, just flipping through the bylaws that are available electronically online, there's a lot of stuff that no longer applies. Going back to horses and things like that that you can find in there that are, you can get rid of a bunch. What do you mean I can't tie my horse to a tree on the common? The no, no parking applies to horses as well, I guess. 
Sorry. Tied up to That's the hitch. A, a lot, Get a apparently. hitch out there. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I can't park. <laughs> can't park my carriage. Can't park your horse. Never mind your carriage. Yeah. So yes. uh, could I get a motion for to establish that committee? Uh, we'll put out an announcement oh, like we, we have in the past. Um, and then uh, you know, get a select board member or two on there as well. So moved. So moved. Second. second. Um, I got <laughs> Joyce and then Amy with the second. Any other discussion on establishing this? Okay, Jennifer. Roll call, Phil? Yes. Kevin Smith? Yes. Jungler? Yes. Ms. Gavitz? How many members? An odd number. Yeah. Five to seven. Yeah, five to seven. Three to five. We'll see who applies and then we'll go. Yeah, I would there. recommend at least five just because you want departments and boards that are impacted by it and that's over three. Right. It's a yes for five then with the amendment. Or you want to vote on the amendment? There is no amendment. I think there is no, yeah, it's just that it exists or that it doesn't exist. The okay. number hasn't been decided. Okay, so, then no. Okay. And then Parsons. Yes. Thank you. That's 4-1. <laughs> All right. And then, uh, Carolyn, administrator report. Is there anything that we didn't already cover? Just an update on the ribbon cutting update. Uh, I just want to thank John Harrison from Hadley Media. He designed a beautiful invitation and a banner that will that will go to printing this week. Uh, David Nixon, who, who will be invited to be there, he had a great suggestion to get a time capsule. So I would like to ask the select board um, what they would like to have in it. I have reached out to Annie to see what the students might want to contribute, but I thought I would leave that up to the select board, uh, what they may have ideas of what they would like in it. So for, for which facility, Carolyn? So I don't know. It has to be. It's, it's well. The time capsule is for the ribbon cutting. I'm not. I guess I'm throwing that out to you. I was just thinking of one that would reflect just the town in general. But that that's another suggestion. If you want to have one for each building, I, I I think we should. I think you know there are two. There are three separate buildings. Um, fire might have something that they would like specifically to put in their time capsule um, that reflects the longevity of the North Hadley fire station and the new move to a new one. Um, certainly it's a brand new senior center that we um, had at the Hooker School is that is no longer there. And of course the library has moved to a new building. So, you know, maybe we can get some input from those three organizations on uh, if they feel that just one is, otherwise it's going to be a hell of a big time capsule. Well, that might actually help because we ordered one and it's way too small. So it actually would be perfect though for one building. So actually, Joyce, that may be a good suggestion. You could do that. All right. Okay. You want to do three? Okay. All right. Um, so that's, that's going smoothly. Uh, Chairman Phil and myself will be meeting with a gentleman from Real Time Energy who would like to share information about a program that Eversource has launched uh, regarding um, subsidizing 100% of LED uh, streetlights. Uh, so we'll have that conversation on Friday and we'll follow up, we'll bring that up to the next meeting. And uh, Jennifer and I attended an opportunity. We, get, we do get to, we are invited to ribbon cutting ceremonies. And I, we went to the Cheesy Grill last week, which was really nice, but it, it, was, it was just nice in general to be going to something positive and seeing the business come to Hadley. So um, I just wanted to update you on that as well. And uh, yesterday I did attend the community breakfast at the University of Massachusetts, had lots and lots of stakeholders there. Uh, and as well as we got entertained by the, uh, the marching band. So that was- Yay, great. I love that part. It, I'm sorry it, I oh, missed it. Was a, it. it was, Really, the speakers were good, but that was great. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, that was really good. And um, Chief Spank Mabel coordinated a unified command meeting um, to discuss town meeting and included the, uh, we included uh, Randy, the, our town moderator, and Dr. Mosler, 
um, regarding just with this, with this, uh, the COVID and where we're at right now and what, how do we guess what, how it's going to be um, in another month. And so we were, we're looking at different options, whether remaining inside or looking outside and where, but we're not, we're not, we weren't ready to really um, have any recommendations for the select board um, until we meet again next week. Uh, Annie has a great database that, that uh, just covers uh, great statistics that help look at what we might think it's gonna be in a couple of weeks or a couple of months. So, um, we just felt it was too premature at this point to decide, um, but we did include Dr. Moser um, in that conversation to give her feedback as well. Can I, so, can I, just, can I chime in on this that I have mm -hmm. knowledge of, um, we do have COVID patients at, uh, in Hampshire County at Cooley. Um, we also have patients that are coming into the emergency room uh, that are not being admitted to the hospital, but are positive for COVID. And it's people that have not been vaccinated. Um, and there are some that have been vaccinated that also have uh, contracted COVID. So the deterrent uh, of Delta has, you know, come into the area. So again, everybody needs to be diligent about how they protect themselves. So I'm just putting in that out there to let you know that those those things are in the area. So we need to be do our due diligence for our own safety and our family safety. I had a question from someone about when the closing date is for putting something on the warrant. Well, my intent is closing the warrant in, uh, at the next select boards meeting. And that's next week or the 15th? 15th. Thank oh. you. Yes. The 15th. Hold on, I just want to check that's the date I have to close it. Yeah, that's what I see yes. in the draft meetings. So, yeah. Yep. Okay, and then the last thing is Mass uh, MMA did uh, put out their announcement that they are having their annual conference take place in Boston in person on January 21st and 22nd. So I wanted to like, let, make sure you all knew that. Uh, Jennifer has a gazillion signatures that she needs from you all. So if you could kind of come in the next two days, if possible, that would be great. And that's yeah, it. I, I just read that in a beacon, Caroline. Are they going to have that meeting optional for some of the classes again online? Um, I did not see that. No, I think it's going to be the intent. What were the dates? What were the dates? 21st, 21st and 22nd which is always a Friday and a Saturday. Uh, do you have time to maybe contact them and ask them if they plan on doing that or not? My understanding is not, it's not gonna be a hybrid approach. None at all, no repeats? I, I can double check, but that it, it, it right, did not yeah. get that appearance, but I can double check. Yes, I just read it tonight. I mean, I can email them too and, and find out. So. Okay. And that's it. All right. Well, we do have executive session tonight, but before we do all that, are there any announcements? I, I have one. Okay to go? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay. So the Hadley and Fire, Hadley Fire and Police will be having the 20th 9-11 Remembrance Ceremony on Saturday, September 11th. We will be conducting the ceremony at the center station and folks are welcome to join us between 9.30 and 9.45 with the ceremony beginning at 9.55. And this is event is rain or shine. So uh, if you feel like joining us, uh, can we hardly imagine that it's already been 20 years since this has happened? Um, God bless all those survivors and families and um if you have a chance to come out and um, support this event. Okay. I have one, um, the Legion ninth annual chicken to go to benefit the Legion mm -hmm. Sunday, September 12th, 2021. Um, there's a noon and a 4 PM, I believe pickup and tickets are 1250. 
And so if you need some, I'll point you in the right direction. Just contact me. But um, that's all I have. Or any Legion member. Yep. Jennifer, go ahead. Um, just a heads up for the town residents. Uh, the transfer station has started offering um, composting as of today. Um, the guidelines are on the town website uh, under the transfer station portion of the website. And um, it is open to residents who have permits only at this time. But the transfer station composting is up and running. It is up and running. I went over and checked it today and they have a separate dumpster to the right of the exit gate. So you would drive up there and put your no more than five gallon pail per week per um, owner of a transfer sticker and you can't combine households. And they're sending it up to Greenfield just in case anybody wants to know where it's going. Uh, not your yard. No, I heard there's some space over on Knightley Road just looking <laughs> for a compost bin. I could point you to a spot there, but uh, it wouldn't be on my, <laughs> my yard. <laughs> any other, any other conservation commission on you? <laughs> any, any other announcements before we go to executive? Motion to adjourn, to adjourn into executive session, not to reconvene in open session. All right, I have to uh, read this. Let's see. Um, all right, so we have the motion by Joyce. Okay. Oh, yeah. I got to read the paragraph ahead of time. Uh, select board will hold an executive session for the pur following purposes per MGL chapter 30A section 21A2 to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel, human resources, and per MGL chapter 30A, section 21A3, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining <laughs> if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining position of the public body and the chair so declares. Uh, UPSU dispatch unit and UPSU local 424 unit MADIV 108 Hadley Public Works employees. So Joyce, we, you wanna repeat your motion there? I'll make a motion to adjourn, not to reconvene, to, to adjourn to go into executive session, not to reconvene an open session. Okay. Second. All right, motion by Joyce, second by Amy. Uh, let's see, as chair of the Hadley Select Board, I state that the board has moved and seconded to enter into executive session, and then I state that discussing the matter in open session will have an adverse effect on the town of Hadley. And Jennifer, roll call vote. Roll call vote, Phil? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Chungaloo? Yes. Wiskevitz? Yes. And Parsons? Yes. And we'll Thank see you. everybody else back on September 15th. <laughs>